Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Insecurity, 2,600 dead. 50 communities record 135 attacks in Benue. Now, the World's Human Rights Organization and Amnesty International said insecurity has left over 2,600 people dead and over 50 rural communities in Benue State have recorded a total of 135 attacks in the last year. The organization called on the federal government to halt and investigate the attacks. Now, joining us to discuss this is Samson Ajibadi, is a criminologist and security expert. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So we're talking about insecurity, and this is coming from, you know, the WHO, who said, who has said that, you know, there's been so many attacks, over 2,600 people have been dead, especially in Benue State, and the rural communities have seen over 135 attacks. Um, this is quite an alarming number, because when you think of a whole 2,600 people having to wind up dead, it's quite unfortunate. And I just want to get your take on this. Do you think this report is true? One, and then how did we even get to this point that we're seeing this amount of people die and the government is not really doing anything to ensure that enough investigation is being done and the perpetrators are being brought to book? Okay, thank you so much. How do we confirm if this isn't true? If there are no counter opinions mm -hmm. or if there are no counter claims? The thing is this, let me begin with this. Um, if I would have to reference it from the local parts, because the attacks were all on local communities. Let me begin with a paraphrase statement of the former director of national intelligence, uh, Ambassador John Negroponte. Whatever happens far away, or whatever happens abroad can kill us at home. The thing is, when this thing started, many of us were oblivious, government and even authorities were oblivious. And I've always said that our government operates on that principle I call the principle of non-denier denier. Like you said, how true is this report? Amnesty International made its claims, did its uh, investigations and all, and brought out reports. Have we had reports from any of these government departments? Have we had reports from any of these government authorities? So it is their own reports that would help balance opinion here. However, until then, we should still believe, believe this and act on it. Let us believe it and act on it. Now, the reliability of the government uh, reports should now be our concern. How objective would this report be? This should be our concern. Has the government ever been objective in its approach? Has the government ever been objective in its findings and reports? Amnesty International is, is a non-governmental organization. It does not belong to the government. So its own will still be much more reliable than what the government would produce. Because many a time, the, the PR of the government is based on the principle of non denial denial. Let me quickly explain the, this uh, principle of non denial denial that I'm talking about here. Now, when they tell you it happened, 202,600 people died and all. The government could come and say, okay, yes, people died, but not as it's been escalated by the uh, organization or other uh, media organizations. It was okay. Uh, 260, they said 2,600 people died, but just 200 people died. They never denied that it happened, but they denied a lot of, uh, they denied a part of it. That's the principle of non-denial, denier. Mm -hmm. They could say, oh, people were displaced, but just few people were displaced. In fact, people were never raped. But in this report, they said children and women, 80% uh, of them were victims. And some of them were even raped. The government could say, oh, they were not raped, but a lot of people were displaced. So that is the principle of non-denial denial here. Now, when it comes to uh, what I said earlier, that whatever happens far away can kill us at home. What I'm saying here is incessant attacks on local communities and uh, the government behave like nothing is happening. And even the Nigerian people behave like nothing, nothing has happened. Imagine military officers being attacked without resistance. Imagine foreign investors being kidnapped without resistance. 
I tell you, when these people are done with locals, when they are done with local communities, they would move to the city, they will move to the political class, the areas where political class reside, where they feel they are much more safer. The reason you see even in cities now, a lot of attacks are going on. The government has been oblivious, probably nonchalant, and they <coughs> have been, one of the reasons they have not been giving us reports, and I tell you, Thanks to, uh, to this media, to this uh, organization, uh, Amnesty International, that is giving us this. Probably we wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have even had a, a comprehensive report about what is going on in, uh, in, uh, in Benue State. Okay, Mr. Agibade, we, we are concerned, not just that Amnesty International has given this report, but... In a country where data is not taken seriously, we fear that even this figure given by Amnesty International is lower than the figure that mm. actually may be. So our concern this morning is, like Rume asked, how did we get here? And if we know how we got here, then maybe we can retrace our steps yeah. back to where we should be. What is it that is missing from all this thing the government is claiming they are doing to curb insecurity, what is it that is missing that in a year, inside one state, we can have a report of over 2,000 people losing their lives and so many people displaced? What is that missing factor that the government needs to look into and make sure that our people are safe? Okay. You asked earlier, you said, how did we get here? And I said that whatever happens far away, when it happened far away, people were oblivious. The government wasn't too concerned. They felt they were safe, they, are in a, they have the security architecture to, pro, to protect them. One of the reasons, how did we get here? Now, let's quickly talk about banditry. And another thing we should note about this report is, this report didn't really emphasize on the cause or those perpetrating the crime. Mm. But we know that in Benue, it is a uh, headers clash yeah. or banditry in Benue state. We know that as the middle belt. Now, here is a simple answer. When the government that has the monopoly of violence, according to Max Weber, becomes docile, when it becomes docile, leaving a large expanse of land or areas ungoverned or uncultivated, I tell you, non-state actors will certainly take control of the space, of the ungoverned space, and perpetrate evil acts. How did we get here? This is one of the, one of the points here. A large expanse of land left ungoverned now where are these bandits where are these criminal elements where are they hiding they hide in these ungoverned spaces so the solution here is until we begin to extend government or expand the administration into some of the areas that look ungoverned the forests that are ungoverned Areas where they do not have the impact or where they, where they do not feel the inf influence or impact of the government. Let's begin to extend our administration to that part. I tell you, this thing would, would uh, reduce. On the other hand, if over 50 uh, communities they attacked in the last year, we should begin to ask, how about the security architecture in those areas, the police stations in those areas? Do they still open at all? The offices, units of uh, civil defense uh, uh, formations in that area, do they still open? And how equipped are these formations, these security formations? These are some of the things we should begin to note. If 50 communities, probably 50 stations or police stations are uh, partly shut down. This is the point here. And you also made mention of uh, uh, the public believing what Amnesty International is giving out. Amnesty International is uh, a non-governmental organization. The only people that, uh, that, that, uh, that the whole obligation is the public. And the government is not coming up with a report. Then, which report do we believe? If you as you said, how reliable do we believe in this? We would believe in this because there is no counter opinion. There are no counter opinions or counter arguments or counter claims yet. This is what we believe, and the government should also believe this. And in believing this, it will titillate them to 
to also conduct their own investigation and come with come up with a counter opinion then we have a balance that is it so do you think that the government is actually doing enough you know to be able to curb this insecurity because 2600 is a large number so before this amount of people actually die um, the government should have known that you know their communities are being attacked so do you think they have enough intelligence in the first place for them to do enough to ensure that they curb insecurity in our nation uh, uh, do I think the government is doing enough the government is doing its best <clears throat> but I tell you there is a concentrate there is no uh, there is no equal distribution of uh, security architecture that is it we have a lot of facilities. In fact, if you go to military formations, you will see a lot of instruments, a lot of equipment and all. But these are concentrated to, pro to protect a class of people. That is it. So we, it depends on the part we are looking at. The government will say, the government is doing enough. But when the duty of the government is to protect lives and property, mm -hmm. locals should also be involved. The reason some are clamoring for community oriented policing, but when it comes to the analysis of community oriented policing or state policing, there is, there is a misconception. Community oriented policing is not state policing, but that will be a story for, for another day. Is the government doing enough, especially in, in intelligence gathering, as you mentioned? See, the government has more than enough intelligence. Mm. The government has more than, the DSS has more than enough intelligence. The Office of uh, the National Security, they have more than enough intelligence. Guarding intelligence is not all that matters when it comes to conflict, uh, to, to conflict or crime fighting. Acting on, uh, on credible intelligence is what matters. We have a lot of intelligence uh, organizations. In fact, private companies, well, media organizations are also coming up. Part of the intelligence we are talking about is even one of the, is even these reports. But acting on it, there are a lot of reports, there are a lot of reports, but acting on it is what matters here. The government wouldn't act on it. Maybe one of the reasons the government isn't acting on it is because crime here. Years ago, I wrote an article. I said the economics of war. Crime here is a huge market. It is an organized crime. Poor people wouldn't take uh, uh, go into a crime like this. Though the fighters could be poor people, but I tell you, those behind it are not just those we see who walk all around the streets. It is an organized, uh, an organized venture. One of the reasons, they probably they are not acting on the intelligence they have with them. But I tell you, intelligence, intelligence, intelligence is there. We have more than enough to work upon or to work with. In fact, foreign organizations even have more intelligence. And I tell you, our local intelligence agencies are also well equipped with enough intelligence to act on it. But being an organized crime, this is one of the reasons, you know, that's godfatherism and hold. This is one of the reasons it is very difficult to fight here. And you also asked earlier, what should the government do further? Well, they should keep gathering more intelligence and they need to act on it. On the other hand, communications. Communications is, all, is also a very good, good point here. Look at these local communities. If you visited some of these communities, you see that network in those areas are very poor. There's what you call digital divides. Many of them do not, do not have access to internet. How do they now report things? Thanks to, uh, to these organizations coming up to do their investigation to come up. Mr. Adibale, we, we seem to have lost his audience. Okay. Many of the, of the crime So, on, go on. communications here. As things are happening, how do you quickly communicate with, with the, the local uh, police officers, police stations, police formations, or even the, the outside world? Well, and on the other hand, people have saying, also advocated saying, or recommended that we have a, a special police, a special formation, the strike force or the special forces or the commando. Now, all of these things are in the military. All of these things are there. But they would wait for someone to give them instructions. If the instructions are not given, even if you have uh, strike uh, forces, uh, uh, special forces like the, like the Brazil and all, this will still not be functional because of interest. And we need to note that, at least now, we need to know that for anything, for crime to continue in a society or for conflict to continue in a society, I tell you, there are three things. That is perception, 
interests and needs. The major cause of banditry or elders clash attacks in uh, in Benue. What is the major cause? Perception. Some people feel they should have absolute access to the land, the resources, the land, which is the resource, which is the major resources there. That is a major cause of the conflict in Benue states. Interest, interest of stakeholders, interest of stakeholders, and the need of some people. Some people feel they need this land. Some people feel they need these resources. This is, this is one of the reasons it is very much difficult. And those who feel they need it, they are not just ordinary people. They have the support of big wigs. So that is it. Well, um, whatever you're saying is painting a very gloomy picture. If, not, if the security agencies have enough intelligence and they are not acting on it, I don't know if this is doomed is spelling doom for the people. Do you subscribe to what um, maybe security experts like T.Y. Danjuma, for instance, has said that people have to defend themselves? Do you subscribe to that? If you don't, then what is the way forward? You say, okay, people have to defend themselves. But in the process of defending yourself, if that act is against the provisions of the law, then you still become a criminal. Do you understand? Mm. And you would also be asked, if you have to defend yourself, there's something called the proliferation of arms. How did you get something to defend yourself? Then you should explain before the law courts. So any act, no matter how good it is, if it is not done in accordance with the constitutional provisions, I tell you, one will still be a victim. And those who are defending themselves do not have backings. They don't have support of big wigs in government. Then one will become a victim. My advocacy is this. I have advocate for community-oriented policing. Though some say, oh, state policing, okay, if state policing is what we would achieve, achieve before we go into community-oriented policing, that would be very much better. But community-oriented policing is bringing uh, security to the community, making uh, locals take charge of their security, because security, they say, is local. To fight insecurity, we need to localize security. Place it in the hands of locals. I tell you, locals, they, they, they have a lot of intelligence. What uh, Amnesty International got, they got it from, from locals. In fact, I'm sure most of these things were not got, gotten from government departments because government uh, data may not be too perfect to work with. So they got it from locals. If they got intelligence, if, you, if the best source when it comes to intelligence gathering is, local, is the, the local people, then Place security in the hands of locals. I tell you, they would, they would always, uh, they would find a way out, out of it. And even when we empower locals, when it comes to security, there should be a standing force. There should be a strike force who is always willing. That strike force that wouldn't need to wait until it receives instructions from Abuja. There's also a, there's also a need to to empower and equip local stations. If 50 communities were attacked, how equipped are these stations, these police stations, the civil defense there? How equipped are these police formations there, or security formations there? Then this tells us, I, I, I just sit back to, to look at how, how the, these stations would have been. So many of them would have even been attacked and security, security officers or police there would be left with no option down to run for their for their dear lives. So we need to why we empower locals on intelligence gathering or why we place uh, security in their hands, we also need to empower the state and the former security formation, like the civil defense and the police, let them be well equipped to act to, to, to respond. Also our response time, our response time is always is not is always very low. Very low. So if, if they are well equipped, the, the response, you've gone to, you've called a police station and they tell you the vehicle is this, the vehicle is that. How many of them have uh, that, uh, this ballistics uh, helmet and all? How equipped are these, uh, are, are these uh, security responders? If you need to respond to, to situations, then you must be well equipped to carry out uh, your, your response. So that is it. Hello?
the amnesty. Hello? In can you hear me? Can Hello? you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Too, yeah, I said it's quite unfortunate that we're getting reports like this from Amnesty International because, I mean, nobody should lose their lives this way. And we know that the primary responsibility, the primary purpose of the government is to ensure security and welfare for the people. So if we're seeing that, um, you know, insecurity is becoming a menace in the society, we would expect that the government would try to do something about that. Now, seeing this number, we hope that it would just jumpstart something where they start to look at how they can secure the lives and properties of Nigerians. And hopefully, um, you know, we will get to a place where we we're safe in our country and we're not scared looking back and, and saying if someone is going to come for us, is going to kill us, maim us, kidnap us or, or something of sort. Anyways, this is where we have to wrap it up here today. We want to say thank you, Samson, for coming and just bringing your insights on this matter. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day. Okay, we're speaking with Sam Singh at Jibade. He's a criminologist and security expert. And we'll be talking about how 2,600 people have died with 135 community clashes in Benue State. And we hope that the government is doing something when it comes to our security infrastructure in Nigeria. This is where we have to wrap it up on the show today. Thank you for having a breakfast with us. My name is Rome Paulson. And I am Nyamgul Agaji. See you again tomorrow.